Welcome to College Smart Radio, helping you bring into focus the true cost of college and how to tackle the runaway cost of financing a college education. College Smart Radio is hosted by Beatrice Schultz, a certified financial planner and founder of West Face College Planning. Now, here's your host for College Smart Radio, Beatrice Schultz. Welcome to College Smart Radio. Making sure that your student will have met all the requirements to apply for college and have the best application possible is an important part of the high school years. One of those requirements is the SAT reasoning test. Nearly every college in America accepts the SAT or subject test as part of its admissions process. More than 2 million students take the SAT every year. On today's College Smart Radio program, we're going to talk about the SAT, what it is, how important it is, and when and how to prepare for it. Hi, I'm Beatrice Schultz. Welcome to our weekly show, College Smart Radio, where we help you tackle the runaway costs of a college education. Our show is all about bringing up-to-date and practical advice to parents who are dealing with the cost of a college education for their kids. With some traditional private schools costing well over $60,000 a year, a UC costing $35,000 today, and a California State University running $25,000, parents need more help than ever. We bring you that help by sharing ways to pay less, tapping into financial aid, and prioritizing your source of funds to make sure you get through the most expensive years of your life. Based on my own education and experience, I share my insights with you week in and week out. I hold a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from Queen's University in Canada and a Master's degree in International Business from Boston's University's Brussels campus. I'm a certified financial planner and the owner of the San Carlos-based college planning business, West Face College Planning. I host workshops and webinars on college funding and consult with parents on a daily basis. And in addition to my insights, I bring in experts in many areas of the college process, from educators, counselors, financial professionals, admission officers, parents, and even students, you'll learn firsthand the ins and outs of how to pay for college and survive financially. In addition to our show, you can find lots of powerful information on our website, www.collegesmartradio.com. We have many articles that I've authored with up-to-date information on navigating the waters of paying for the runaway cost of college. I have a monthly e-newsletter full of content about college planning. We also have posted a glossary of key terms used in the world of college planning, terms like SAT, ACT, FAFSA, and so forth. And we have a link to our free community parent workshops and webinars that I host to teach parents how to pay for college and how the financial aid system really works. So let's get into today's show. Officially, the SAT is a globally recognized college admission test that lets you show colleges what you know and how well you can apply that knowledge. It tests your knowledge of reading, writing, and math, subjects that are taught every day in high school classrooms. Most students take the SAT during their junior or senior year of high school, and almost all colleges and universities use the SAT to make admission decisions. Many parents are confused by exactly what the SAT is, what are subject tests, and how does the SAT compare to the ACT? Should you take one, the other, or both? Should you take it more than once? What does it all mean? My guest on today's College Smart Radio program was a popular guest on our show last fall when we discussed what defines a great extracurricular profile and how to build one. In the studio with me today is Eddie Lemire. Eddie has served on boards with the National Association of College Admission Counselors and was trained at the Southern Association of College Admissions Counselors. He worked in private college admissions at Loyola University for three years, and he worked for the University of California for five years. For the past six years, Eddie has worked as an independent consultant. He's the owner of the Mirror College Consulting in the Bay Area. I've invited him here today to talk about the SAT, what it is, and everything a parent should know about it. Hi, Eddie. Welcome back to College Smart Radio. Beatrice, it's so nice to be here talking about the pain that is the SAT. There's a lot to cover. All right. Well, let's start. What is it? It's it's the nightmare of a lot of high school students beginning from 8th grade and going all the way up through 12th grade. Basically, what it is is the the standard admissions test that the majority of colleges and and universities in the country are going to need, scored on a scale of 2,400, with three different sections that students are attacking, critical reading, math, and writing. Long story short, the higher they score, the better it is. But it's a necessary component of the college application process. 
So it is necessary. I mean, kids are like, I'm a terrible test taker. I mean, are you saying you have to take this test to give to have, to have all your options open? Recently, there have been some schools that have moved away from the traditional st- testing required stance among those Wake Forest University in North Carolina, Colby College in Maine, Bates College in Maine, and other private schools will usually get a little bit creative with how they can allow students to submit test scores. But 90% of the colleges in the country that students want to attend, 90% of the the top tier schools are going to want to see some sort of standardized test, ACT or SAT. And oftentimes those kids that are applying to those specific schools are probably applying to other ones. So I think all of our listeners should assume you might as well learn about the SAT and plan that it's going to be part of the college admission process. So why did it get started? What, do you know anything about the history of it or what's yeah, the story? Yeah, it's, it's something that is uh, – it, it has a history that's been going on for about 100 years. It was originally set up as a uh, – as a – an aptitude test. The, the the acronym or the initialism was an initially that, gauging returning veterans and their IQ as they would come back from World War II and look for places in order to pursue higher education. You need some, some way of comparing apples to apples. The SAT was a way to do this with a lot of vets that would come home from the wars. Over time, it started developing into a test that was not only used by the top-tier schools, the Ivies was what it was originally used for, but everybody sort of started adopting it. So by the time the 70s wound up rolling in, every school in the country for the most part was using some form of standardized testing, either the SAT or the ACT. It's encountered a lot of changes over the last 30 years, a whole lot over the past 10 years. Most of your listeners, if they took it, will probably remember it being on an 1,800-point scale when it used to be just verbal and math. Now, like I said, it's on a 2,400-point scale, three different sections, 800 points apiece. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the test works and then I, I some other things. But is it... Do you do it all in one seating, all three sections in one seating? Correct. It's um, Saturday afternoons, usually the first or second Saturday of the month, typically seven times a year, three times during the fall, four times during the spring. Lasts about three hours and 45 minutes, and everything is covered in that three hours and 45 minutes. Math equations, not only multiple choice, but some fill-ins. Uh, critical reading, long passages and short, short passages, vocabulary and context, writing, an essay, grammar. So pretty much just about everything having to do with reading, writing, and arithmetic are covered in three hours and 45 minutes. So I, enjoy that Saturday morning. I mean, well, I, I, I can't remember the number that I, I said about how many SATs are are completed in a year, but who's marking all these SATs? Well, thank I mean, goodness well, for Especially Scantron. the essays. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, with essays, it's more than just a multiple choice. No, the essays in the writing section itself is actually scanned by uh, by by real human beings that will wind up going through the essay that uh, that, scared on, that scale it on a score of one to six. That essay uh, takes two scores from one to six, combines them together so the student has a score out of 12 that they could possibly get on this essay section. That essay section is combined with some of the multiple choice from the writing section to produce a scaled score out of 800. Okay, so let's talk about 800 or uh, so more commonly we hear about it under, out of 2400 mm-hmm. and well you so let's start with that what's a good score it depends on where you're looking at it it depends on the background of the student um, traditionally speaking if you're looking at um, what are called the HYPS schools Harvard Yale Princeton Stanford the real top tier blue chip schools you're probably looking at about a 2150 to 2200 to start being competitive when you're looking at top tier public schools those are schools that are going to weigh the GPA a little bit more and weigh the SAT a little bit less. So you look at UC Berkeley, which is basically the public Ivy in the country, and you're probably looking at about a 2040 or 2050 on the test. So there's always going to be that division between the two. The private schools are going to really prize the SAT a whole lot, and typically top-tier private schools will have higher SAT scores than top-tier public schools will. And will they, in from the admissions perspective, because I know that you've worked in admissions uh, do they, is it typically like you need to add a minimum get over 2000 to be considered? Or do they have a minimum or do they just all take it into account? With UC, it's a little bit more qualitative historically than private schools have been, or a little bit more quantitative. Let me say that, but yeah. let me correct that. Histor- UC has been a little bit more quantitative and the public schools have been a little bit more qualitative. With the public schools, they're going to look at the whole student in context. It's something called a holistic review. There's really no threshold that a student has to hop over. With UC, Even as qualitative as it is, as quantitative as it is, I can't believe I keep making that mistake, quantitative as it is, still, there's not going to be as much of that, uh, there's not going to be as much of a threshold. There's going to be a range that students will be expected to score within, but it's not something that's a deal breaker. There are other things that can outweigh the score. But again, 
in a nutshell, the higher you score, the better off you're going to wind up being. Okay, so what's the national average for SAT scores? It's going to be around 1,500, 1,510, right thereabouts. So when you're looking at a 2,200, 2,150 being what you need to really be competitive as what would be called an unhooked applicant to the top tier schools, then it really is, it's a daunting task, scoring 600, 650 points above the national average. Okay, and so uh, if you wanted to go to a state school in California, Sacramento State, Chico State, what kind of SATs would you expect to see with, on average there? Probably a little bit higher than the national average, but not a whole lot more, around 1650, 1700. It's not going to be quite as high as UC, and it's not going to be really that close to Stanford. But again, state schools are in the business of admitting and educating general members of the state. It's not as though they are trying to exclude 95% of the applicants, which a lot of Ivy League schools will. Sure. And so when we think about the three different marks, the reading, math, and writing, if you got a high mark in one versus the other two, are the schools looking at the individuals or they tend to look at the overall SAT score? More often than not, it's the aggregate. You still have a couple of schools that are in the top tier that are dragging their feet and still only looking at the 1600 point scale, not looking at writing yet, even though writing was introduced about eight to ten years ago okay but they're still only looking at critical reading and math more than anything else though most schools in the country are going to look at the aggregate they're going to look out of the 2400 and they're not going to wind up splitting hairs between the individual sections if something's glaring if there's a 500 on the critical reading and 800s on math and writing then maybe you might smell that there's something rotten in denmark but outside of that it's usually just going to be the overall score so compared to the other parts of the admission process and i you know you take you're looking at all the different parts of the admission. How does the SAT compare in importance to the GPA, to the uh, your other transcript information? Sure. The, 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 the dean of admissions at Harvard had a really good point, and I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering the, the quote, but he said something like, the SAT is, um, is more important than college admissions. It's, it's less important than students, um, than students think it is, but far more important than college admissions offices want to admit. The most important piece of the college application, no matter what, is going to be the transcript. That's the centerpiece of everything, the GPA and the rigor of the classes that the student has taken. Not finding that, not falling that much further behind, though, is the SAT. For the most part, the SAT is going to wind up coming in pretty close second to the uh, to the college transcript. It's not a deal breaker. It's not the end all be all, but it is incredibly important, and it's a lot more important than colleges will tell you. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a break right now. You're with us on College Smart Radio, where my guest today is Eddie Lemire, owner of Lemire College Consulting. We're going to be right back on AM 1220 KDOW with Eddie Lemire on College Smart Radio. For more information on today's topic, visit collegesmartradio.com or call area code 650-587-1559. College Smart Radio continues in moments on AM 1220 KDOW. Contact Beatrice Schultz at collegesmartradio.com or call area code 650-587-1559. Now, back to College Smart Radio with your host Beatrice Schultz on AM 1220 KDOW. Welcome back to College Smart Radio where we help you tackle the runaway costs of college. I'm Beatrice Schultz. I'm talking with my guest, Eddie Lemire of Lemire College Consulting, about the SAT reasoning test, what it is and how important it is. We all know that college is expensive and will most likely be some of the most costly years for a family, and understanding how to navigate the college process and also to save everywhere you can is a smart thing to know. So to help families be on this radio show, I host community workshops live and via webinar several times a month that explain the cost of various colleges, how the financial aid system works, and things to consider to prepare yourself for this tremendous expense. You can find my workshop schedule and register at collegesmartradio.com. Eddie, we were just talking about the importance of the SAT. Let's talk a little bit about how students should be pre- preparing to do the SAT. Sure, of course. And that's the that's a multi-million dollar industry, and it's something that kids can really be begin as soon as parents find it necessary, as soon as parents would really like. They can start getting students acquainted with doing better on the SAT through nothing else aside from having them read above grade level. And that's something when I was in private consulting with a larger company, we would have students come in that were in fifth and sixth grade and parents would want to prepare them for the SAT. It's impossible to do it in terms of a strategy at that level, but kids do need to read above grade level very, very early. They need to read hard stuff, and they read to need to read hard stuff quickly because that's one thing that you're going to find with a lot of students with the SAT, the time, the speed, the reading. 
That is great advice and something that all of our listeners can be listening to. And, and I think so many of our kids aren't reading as much as we did as kids. Not at all. And that's a, that's 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 great. So um, that's good. And I like that that's not just about preparing for the test, but mm-hmm. that's about re- building up some great skills. Now, that I know there are SAT prep classes. When should you take the SAT and what type of what type of preparation should you do? Okay, every student is going to be different. So everything really that, that we're ever going to talk about with college admissions is going to differ from student to student. But the stock answer is going to be the student should take a prep class summer before junior year. They should take the SAT typically once fall of junior year, so the prep class will run up until that first time they take it, so there won't be any of that brain drain or knowledge So you drain. recommend prepping before you even take it first time. I've heard people say, oh, I'll take it, and then I'll prep and, and do better the second time. No, you Why really bother? don't. No, I wouldn't do that, because then you start getting into the, you'll, you'll start getting into a, a habit of taking it often, and you'll take it almost to practice, and yeah. st- schools don't want to see that. The SATs that you take, they should be prepared for, and they're really precious, because the schools are going to see those, and even though they may take the highest score, you don't want to leave a bad impression under any circumstances. That's a great question, and I'll let you come back to explain it, but um, do the do you have to submit all your SAT scores? Do you only submit the highest? Can they pick and choose? I hear different stories. Do colleges do it differently, or how does that work? Outstanding question. Colleges will do it differently, and there is actually something, a phenomenon that came into play a couple of years ago called score choice that the, our friends at the SAT, the college board, did presumably to allow students a little bit more choice in sending what scores they send out, but really just to make a little bit more money compared to their competitors, the ACT. So what score choice does is it allows students to withhold or send really whatever SAT scores they like. However, colleges have parried that by saying, no, we want to see all of your test scores. So then students are kind of in a bind. They have college board telling them, you can send whatever you like, but then Stanford saying, we want to see them all. So it does turn into a little bit of a uh, of a difficult choice for a lot of high school students they really shouldn't be put in the middle of. But long story short, in a nutshell, you can withhold scores. You can send out other scores. You don't have to submit everything. But if you want to be honest, you want to do what the schools say that, that they uh, that they want you to do, probably 75% of the time you will be sending all of the scores in. And the message that I'm hearing is most people do do it more than once. So maybe we can go back to that original question I asked you. Sure. Yeah, how many times should you do it and... I would do a very good question again. The um, I would do again the prep course summer before junior year. I'd take it once fall of junior year, once spring of junior year, then once fall of senior year for cleanup more than anything else. A lot of this will depend on the student's baseline score on where they're at when they start doing SAT prep. And a lot of it will also depend on what classes they're in. For instance, if you have a student that's a slow math kid and they're not going to get to Algebra 2 until their junior year, you don't want to have them taking the SAT in the fall of their junior year because it covers through Algebra 2. So that's what I was saying earlier, that it does really, it's contingent upon the individual student more than anything else. But in theory, three times, fall, spring, fall, prep course before junior year. So three times. And when you see your students that mm-hmm. do three times, do they tend to do better? Yeah, but after that, the um, after the third time, the law of diminishing returns sort of starts kicking in, and there, there's not going to be... There'll be a marginal benefit beyond that, but not much more. So that's why we'll usually stop at three times, and that's the extent of it. If the student can hit the target score in fewer than three times, we always advocate it. You'll find a lot of students that'll wind up scoring in the 2300s the first time out. Not a lot, but you'll find some. I should and say would, that. And would that student even do it again? No, they wouldn't. They're done. <laughs> yeah, they're done. They're they, done. They've had a great score. Yeah. So um, from a, you talked about doing the SAT in the fall of the junior year, but isn't that when commonly students are doing their PSAT, or would they be doing it earlier? No, PSATs will do it at the same time often. Really around – this area is a little bit of a different kettle of fish just because students are so advanced. In most parts of the country, students will take the PSAT really as a practice for the real SAT – Here they're doing it oftentimes after the real SAT, and they're using it more than anything else for national merit scores, which is something that the PSAT can be used for. It's a small scholarship competition, but outside of that, students really don't get a whole lot from it. They're doing it because they're doing it out of necessity because the school is taking it. Everybody in the school is doing it more than anything else. Their practice has already been done as freshmen and sophomores. Oh, okay. And so is there any prep for the PSAT? No. No. It's sort of the PSAT isn't even a prep for SAT? Is that... It's a it's it's yeah. for for most students in most parts of the country it'll be prep for SAT but here more than anything else it's just another test that people take because they've been preparing for SATs for so long already. So I hear that sometimes I've heard the difference some family some students choose to take the SAT some take the ACT some take both 
then I've heard, oh, boys do better at the ACT <laughs> and smart kids, you know, fast kids do better. So what's your thought on, do you do them both? Do you choose one? How, how do you decide as a student or a parent? Do a practice test with both, even before doing the, the prep course. Just get the, just get the SATs book on the SAT, get the ACT book that has real ACT tests in it, set aside a couple of Saturdays, take diagnostic tests in both of them, see which one you score better at. The ACT and SAT are different tests. The SAT, like we said, out of 2,400. The ACT out of 36. Everybody takes both, so students should be fine taking both. It's just that out here, the ACT is not that popular because it's a Midwestern test. My students, I've found, score significantly higher on the ACT than the SAT. The ACT is more straightforward. It's more content-oriented. However, there are more questions and the time is more compressed. So if you're if speed is not one of your attributes, the SAT will be better for you. If speed is one of your attributes, perhaps the ACT would be better. In other words, they're different tests. Try both. See which one you score higher on. So what's the model? Do you do the ACT three times also? Is it the same as the SAT? Yeah, you could. You know, I found, though, that with the ACT, since it's more content-oriented, a little bit straightforward, it's tougher to game in terms of the strategy. The SAT, one of the big things with the SAT really is the strategy. Because for every question you get wrong on the SAT, it's minus a quarter point from your raw score. It's not the same thing on the ACT. So with the SAT, you really do have to have these strategies that you employ. For instance, when I used to tutor SAT out of college, I would always re- refer to student refer to questions in three different ways. Green light, yellow light, red light questions. Green light, you always answer. Yellow light, sometimes red light, you never answer. Don't even touch. The strategy will be different with the ACT because they don't ding you for wrong answers. So again, very, very different tests, very different approaches. That's why there are just aisles of books on this at Barnes & Noble. (laughs) So the ACT scored 1 through 36 average across America. Any idea what that is? Eh, Probably is going to be probably between 19 and 21. Okay, and yeah, then probably twenty one. Yeah, the Ivy, the Harvard, Stanford's. What are they looking for on the ACT? Uh, thirty two, thirty three, maybe upwards of thirty four, right around that neck. Oh, of the so woods. pretty close to the thirty six number. Yeah. yeah. So when you, um, I also hear about these subject tests. Is that separate from the three different structures that are in the ACT? What, what's the story of the subject tests? The subject tests, more often than not, schools will recommend that students, and this is especially for elite schools, schools will recommend that students take two to three subject tests depending on the school. There's really only been one school or three schools that advocate three subject tests, Princeton, Harvard, and Georgetown, and they don't even really do that too much anymore. Um, But the subject tests are basically tests in different subject areas. They used to be called achievement tests, and they're in the five basic areas of of high school learning. Math, science, foreign language, English, social science. There are multiple tests in each of those little categories, aside from English, which just has literature. And uh, students will want to take two tests from from two different subject areas, one test from each of two different subject areas. And where do the, when do they take the test? When do, is that a different date? And- it would be a different date. You can take one SA re- SAT reasoning test on a Saturday, or up to three SAT subject tests on a single Saturday. Okay, and could you take an ACT but take an SAT subject test for yes. a college? Yes, and oftentimes schools will request that. Or they will say, if you've taken the ACT, usually the ACT without writing will require two subject tests from you as well. ACT with writing, oftentimes it'll be the same thing. Okay, so anything um, anything else kind of for the SAT that we should know that is weird or that's prepping or any... It's not a deal breaker. Don't stress out too much. There, there is something also called super scoring where colleges will take the highest categorical score from multiple sittings. Um, again, it's not as important as you think it is as a student, but it still is really important. And the big thing, get started early on the fundamentals, reading, writing, mathematics. Don't do a strategy test too. Don't do a strategy course too early and you'll be fine. And what do you mean by strategy course? No. A strategy course would be something like a test prep course at – Okay. Sure, like one okay, of the big okay. the big players. Well, Eddie, thanks so much for joining us on College Smart Radio. A link to Eddie's Lemire College Consulting website is available on our College Smart Radio website, as well as a description of his college admission consulting services. You can learn more about the SAT also on the College Board website. Well, that wraps up another weekly show of College Smart Radio. 
We hope you picked up some new information today that helps you figure out ways to manage the runaway costs of college. You can hear us each week here on AM 1220 KDOW, Saturdays at 3 p.m. We promise to bring you up-to-date information from the front lines of helping parents deal with the most expensive years of their lives. For a link to a podcast of this show and our prior weekly shows, go to our website, collegesmartradio.com. In addition to the podcast, you'll also find a schedule of our upcoming shows. Plan to join us at one of the upcoming West Face College Planning Workshops. You can reserve a seat for a workshop, either live or via webinar, from the show's website, collegesmartradio.com. I also have great tips and links to articles on my Facebook page. You can visit my West Face College Planning Facebook page, and don't forget to like it. This is Beatrice Schultz. Thanks for tuning in to College Smart Radio. We look forward to sharing more helpful information with you next week. You've been listening to College Smart Radio with Certified Financial Planner Beatrice Schultz. If you have questions on today's topic, log on to collegesmartradio.com or call area code 650-587-1559. That's 650-587-1559. Join us next week at this time for another edition of College Smart Radio on AM 1220 KDOW.